good morning everyone uh, so today in this session we will be studying how we can improve the bearing capacity of a soil using geosynthetics so uh, what do you mean by bearing capacity of a soil we have learned different definitions like the ultimate bearing capacity gross bearing capacity so let's make it more simpler uh, bearing capacity of a soil can be said that it is the maximum pressure or maximum load that the soil can take or the soil can support without undergoing shear failure so we have different types of soils we have soils which are having uh, extremely good bearing capacity such as the lactate soil and we also have soils which are having low bearing capacity such as the black cotton soil or marine clay etc so uh, the problem with soft soils is that they are having extremely poor shear strength high compressibility and if the clay content is really high then there uh, you might face a low permeability so many times we are, we are forced to construct on the clay soil or the soft soil always the lactate soil a good soil is not available so many a times we are forced to construct uh, uh, our buildings on the soft soils so, so the problem which we are likely to face is that Mm, that the soil might be having low bearing capacity larger settlements or you can have lateral flow of the soil that is the soil may escape from the underneath of the footing okay that is also one problem and uh, it is difficult to move the uh, construction equipments on these types of soils so here you can see uh, how it difficult it is to work on these types of uh, soft soils so how can you construct a shallow foundation on these types of soils so we have many conventional solutions for this so you can either replace the whole uh, soft soil you can replace it with a good quality fill okay a good quality uh, red earth or you can modify the soft soil in any of the method like you can uh, you can either do some chemical stabilization using lime or cement or you can adopt methods such as preloading sand drains etc in these methods we are actually allowing the uh, soil to consolidate or to settle to achieve a maximum settlement okay uh, in a faster rate okay if these methods are not possible then we have to go for deep foundations so uh these are uh, some of the conventional methods this is the replacing of the soil with a good quality fill usually we adopt the red earth or lactate soil or you can go for some uh, chemical stabilization uh here they have they are stabilizing using uh, lime or you can adopt methods such as preloading sand drains etc or if any of these methods is not possible you can go for deep foundation but the problem with these conventional methods is that these are really time consuming and also expensive so here comes the importance of our geosynthetics we have numerous methods uh, numerous solutions with geosynthetics and these are only a few of them the mainly adopted method is reinforcing the soil with geosynthetics or you can use prefabricated drains or pv drains to uh, to accelerate the consolidation or you can go for an encased stone columns so in this session we are only focusing on reinforcing the soil with geosynthetics so what actually happens is that when you are placing certain reinforcements uh, these reinforcements interrupt with the formation of the rupture surface okay and thus increasing or in, yeah thus increasing the bearing capacity of the soil so we'll uh, see how this is done in the future slides so first we will study about the different forms of reinforcements so the commonly adopted one is the planar reinforcements so in this you are actually having sheets of geosynthetics okay so these are two dimensional uh, sheets of geosynthetics and the commonly adopted one are uh, geotextiles or geogrids so here uh, you can see in the figure you are having a footing uh, of a width b and you can have multiple layers of these geosynthetics okay so here they are used geogrids 
and you can see that the uh, there is a distance between the ground level and the first reinforcement okay this is denoted by the letter u and here delta h is the vertical spacing between the reinforcement layers and the width of th your reinforcement layer is the small b so you uh, here you have to see that the ratio of this small b to capital b has to be greater than 1 okay that means that the width of the geosynthetic layer or the width, the width of our reinforcement has to be greater than the width of your footing okay so next form of reinforcement is the reinforcement strips so here we are using strips of reinforcement so these can be either metallic strips or you can go for synthetic polymer strips okay so here uh, we are having both the vertical spacing as well as the horizontal spacing so here we have to consider both these spacings while designing okay here you can see the real uh, picture of a metal strip okay next uh, form of reinforcement is geocell matrix okay so here uh, we all know what geocells are so geocell ma ma matrix is actually an assembly of different uh, layers or different sheets of geocells uh, having a depth or having a height of h okay here also the distance between the ground surface and the top of your geocell ma matrix is u okay so here d denotes the pocket size of the geocell so this is the actual geocell and this distance okay that is called the pocket size of a geocell another possibility is the combination of the planar uh, uh, geosynthetics and the geocell um, matrix okay so here we are placing uh, an additional planar geosynthetics along with the geocells okay so here you can see in the figure there is an additional planar geosynthetics and above this we are placing our geocells so by doing this we are actually increasing the stiffness of our reinforced uh, of our reinforced soil okay and this method or this type of reinforcement is usually adopted in the case of uh, embankments while constructing embankments on soft soils okay another picture showing uh, geogrid which is a planar uh, geosynthetics along with geocells okay so uh, so now we can see how you can assess the bearing capacity improvement okay we need to we need some sort of measure some sort of test to see how much we are increasing the bearing capacity and for this we have to perform the plate load test okay you must have studied in your geotechnical classes that plate plate load test is one of the tests to find the bearing capacity of a soil okay so here we are doing a series of um, very, uh, plate load test okay uh, by varying the number of reinforcements so the first test can be done with the unreinforced soil then you are placing one layer of reinforcement then doing a test okay, then you are increasing the number of layers uh, you can make n to 2 or n to 3 okay like that and the result of the plate load test is uh, actually a load settlement graph okay so this is the load settlement graph and you can see in the graph that this particular curve the dotted curve corresponds to the unreinforced soil okay and these are the uh, load settlement graphs for curves for reinforced soil so you can see that as we are increasing the number of layers see this is for n is equal to 1 that means one uh, number of uh, re layer of reinforcement here you are having two layers of reinforcement three four like that okay uh, so you can see that as we are increasing the number of layers the curve is actually shifting to the right that means now the particulars that particular soil is able to take more loads okay more uh, uh, yeah more value of loads okay so suppose uh, you are taking a load of 10 kilonewton per meter okay you can see that unreinforced soil is having a settlement of 15 mm 
okay for the same load when while you are keeping one number of layer the settlement is around 10 mm so there is a reduction in the settlement for more number of layers the settlement is actually 5 mm so we have achieved an red reduction in the settlement value okay then another point which we have we can uh, observe from the graph is that okay while increasing the number of layers see uh, after uh, n is equal to 3 we can see that the curves converge okay so uh, after increasing the number of layers beyond a certain value there is no much increment okay the uh, curves are actually being uh, converged okay so these are the inferences from uh, the load uh, from the plate load test so you can see that the bearing capacity of unreinforced soil has been increased by providing the reinforcement layers and as the number of layers is increased the bearing capacity also increases but up to a limiting value uh, that uh, we understood by the convergence of the curves and for a particular load the settlement has been decreased so the net effect or uh, the net uh, effect uh, from uh, using the reinforcement is improvement in the bearing capacity along with reduction in the settlement so for comparing different uh, plate load test see uh, these plate load test uh, varies like one plate load test will be done with the plate of a particular size another uh, it's in in another set of experiment it may be done with a another plate of another size so we need some measure to compare the different results okay so there comes the need of uh, these non dimensional parameters so this is actually for us to compare different experimental results uh, so one of the non dim uh, non dimensional parameter is the bearing capacity ratio so this is actually the uh, bearing it's a ratio of the bearing capacity of reinforced soil to bearing capacity of unreinforced soil okay so to be um, more uh, you know um, more correctly uh, this is actually the footing pressure of the reinforced soil at a particular settlement divided by the footing pressure of unreinforced soil for the same settlement here you have to note that these both footing pressures qr and qu is measured for the same settlement okay so bearing capacity ratio is equal to qr by qu where qr is the footing pressure of a reinforced soil and qu is the footing pressure for unreinforced soil both for the same settlement value okay another a non dimensional parameter is the settlement ratio okay it is the uh, ratio of the settlement uh, divided by the width of your plate or width of your footing okay so these are the two non dimensional parameters okay next we will see an uh, one of the analysis that is binkwit and lee analysis uh, so binkwit is a person along with his guide lee um, has done a series of um, a, a plate load test along with certain analytical studies and uh, they have uh, come to certain conclusions and uh, they have published a paper also in that was in nine, uh, in 1975 and still we are following uh these papers okay so according to uh, this binkwit and lee analysis before uh, uh, doing the test they had certain assumptions like the soil is assumed to be homogeneous okay then uh, they assume that uh, the only uh, deformation is the vertical settlement and that to uniform that means there is no differential settlements okay and they have also assumed that the failure is symmetrical like the failure rupture on the left side of the footing will be same as the failure rupture on the right side that means the failure uh, the pressures uh, uh, everything will be symmetrical okay so next uh, yeah we'll see the binkwit and lee analysis uh, they have said that the reinforced soil when they are loaded 
the reinforced soil can be divided into two zones okay and the dividing line for these two zones is the locus of maximum stress so here a dash c dash and ac are the locus is a locus of maximum stress okay so this is the son one soil in the son one and this these are son two soils okay so, so soil in the son one under loading they uh, they moves downwards along with the reinforcements and the soil in son two they moves outwards outwards and upwards okay so these uh, while moving outwards and upwards they are actually causing a a uh, heave on the ground surface there is a small bulging on the ground surface okay so these are the two zones according to uh, binkwit and lee okay next uh, we'll see the variation of uh, the stresses vertical stress or normal stress and also the shear stress so uh, you can see in the figure that there is a footing over here and uh, assume that it is being loaded uh, it's given a point load at the center okay and uh, you are having different layers of reinforcement level a corresponds to the first layer of reinforcement and level b corresponds to the second layer of reinforcement okay so uh, now we will see the variation of vertical stresses so here this is actually the variation of vertical stresses the vertical stress is maximum at the center line or just below the load we are actually giving a point load uh, over here and the vertical stress is, is maximum just below the load or at the center line or center line okay and after that there is a gradual decrease okay while moving laterally there is a, a gradual decrease in the uh, vertical stress okay now while talking about shear stress the shear stress is minimum or you can say that the shear stress is zero at the center line then it increases to a maximum point and beyond that it decreases okay so here this point is uh, is having maximum shear stress okay and that is for level 1 when you come to level 2 uh, the variation is just same as the level 1 but only thing is that the magnitude of these stresses decrease by a little okay while coming to level uh, level c the magnitude again decreases okay so this is how uh, the variation uh, of stresses happens and it is observed that uh, from the experimental results it's observed that uh, the maths most of the reinforcements they fail at these points or points where the shear stress is maximum okay okay next we will see uh, the failure mechanisms uh, proposed by binkwit and lee okay they have proposed three failure mechanism and the first one is shear failure of unreinforced portion okay so this type of failure happens when uh, when uh, the first layer of the reinforcement is at a greater depth or you can say that there is a greater uh, there is a higher gap between the first layer of reinforcement and the ground or you can say that the ratio of u by b u is this uh, gap divided by the width of your footing is greater than 2 by 3 okay so actually binkwit and lee has proposed certain conditions for each of the failure criteria and this is one of the uh, uh, criteria for this type of failure to happen the u by b ratio has to be greater than 2 by 3 okay the second type of failure is the pull out failure okay this pull out failure generally happens when your reinforcement length is short or you uh, or uh, in other words you when you are having shorter lengths of your reinforcements okay uh, so what happens is that when you are having a shorter length of reinforcement it is very easy to pull out the reinforcement okay so that is the main reason for pull out uh, failure that is shorter lengths of reinforcement and uh, they have also said that this uh, 
uh, type of failure happens when you are having limited number of layers or limited number of reinforcement layers. That is when n is less than, number of layers is less than 3. Okay. And in this case, your u value, u is not, I mean the first reinforcement is not at a greater depth. Okay. So, the u by b value can be less than 2 by 3. Okay, so, here you have to note that you are, you are having shorter lengths of uh, reinforcement, the number of layers is less than 3 and u by b value is less than 2 by 3. So, generally you can say that this is a case of a shallow and light, uh, light reinforcement with short ties. Light reinforcement means you are having lesser number of reinforcement layers. Okay, next is the third uh, failure that is the rupture failure. It is also called tensile uh, failure or tension failure. This happens because of the overstressing of your reinforcement layers. Uh, see, when, when you are stressing or when you are applying load on the, re on the reinforcement or on the footing, if uh, the pressure exceeds the tensile strength of your reinforcement, what happens is that uh, it is unable to take up the uh, pressure and the first layer of reinforcement breaks and now the load is passed to the second layer of reinforcement. If that is also unable to carry the load or unable to take up the pressure, it also breaks. Okay? And then it, it repeats, it is passed to the subsequent layers. Okay? So, this type of failure, in this, in this type of failure, uh, the length of the reinforcement may be uh, may be of the sufficient length. That means there is no pull out failure and the number of layers can be more than 3 also. That means you are having a dense uh, reinforcement. Okay? And in this case also uh, your u value is not at a greater depth or the first reinforcement is not at a greater depth. That means u by b value is less than 2 by 3. Okay, that means there is no chance of the failure in the unreinforced portion. Okay, this is the unreinforced portion. There is uh, no chance of failure in the unreinforced portion. So, generally you can say that this is a case of shallow, long and heavily reinforced um, uh, foundations. Only problem is that either it is overloaded or the tensile strength of reinforcement is not sufficient. Okay, so, we have seen the three failure uh, mechanisms. Okay, the, the first one was the uh, uh, shear failure of the unreinforced portion. The second one was the pull out failure and the third one was the rupture failure. Okay, so, from all these failure, uh, failure mechanisms, we, have, we can um, uh, fix the factors to be considered while designing. That is the depth of the first layer of reinforcement or you can say the U value and then the number of uh, the number of layers of reinforcement the length of reinforcement if you are having insufficient length the uh, there is more chance of pull out failure then tensile strength of reinforcement if this is insufficient then there are more chance of rupture failure and also the vertical and horizontal spacings between the reinforcement layers Okay, if the spacing is very high, then there are chances of some localized failures between the layers of reinforcement. Okay. So, by this uh, we can conclude today's session. Uh, more, more, um, uh, more sessions will be followed in the later presentations. Thank you.